pluralistic society. What that means is that there are differences between virtually everyone in this room. In many instances, these differences will lead to conflict. Now the myth Chambliss and Seidman are referring to is that the state does not take sides in these conflicts. What the authors say is that the legal order is in fact a self-serving system to maintain power and privilege. So the myth then is that somehow this system is neutral and treats everyone equally and fairly and justly. Now this position is very different from the position that we've seen in natural law, in legal positivism, and in tikanga. What natural law, what tikanga, what legal positivism say is that there is universal acceptance, universal agreement on what laws should be. What Chaitlin and Seidman are saying is that is a myth. There is no agreement. What we have is conflict, and we have the state and certain powerful groups within society imposing their will upon everyone else. The first one is referred to as value consensus, and the second one is value antagonism. Groups may disagree, there may be conflict, but there is general agreement surrounding the law and the ability of the legal system to resolve things in a neutral and just manner. The assumption <coughs> is that stability is the norm. And then we try to explain conflict. What we're suggesting is that, or what we're rejecting, is the claim of consensus. So the only reason that riots, or revolutions, or civil wars don't happen more often is because powerful groups are able to access state power to prevent <coughs> weaker groups from causing trouble. The value antagonism model assumes conflict. What it tries to do is to explain stability. <coughs> now, realists believe that judicial decision making, the ruling of courts, is a subjective exercise. So what it does is produce ambiguous, inconsistent, often contradictory results. And we saw this just last week when we were looking at how the courts were dealing with precedent as it pertained to colonial rulings. Think of this in an easier way, majority decisions. You'll often have rulings where it'll be three to two. The numbers will vary, and the question is, how is that possible? All of these judges are looking at the same facts. They're also applying the same law. Presumably, they're drawing upon the same precedent. And yet, they're reaching different conclusions. The point, then, is that judicial decision making is a subjective exercise. What legal realists will say is that what is going to influence the outcome of a case is not merely the facts or the law, but rather the judge. Therefore, their morals, their beliefs, their particular position within society, their upbringing, their schooling. As I said to you with regards to Prendergast, Prendergast was a settler. <coughs> Does it make sense, then, that he would rule in the way he did? Of course. So there are four main ideas to the legal realist movement. The first one is that law protects powerful economic interests first. Second point, the outcome of a legal dispute is determined by a judge's morality a judge's mood, a judge's personality. Judges are not superhuman, judges are human too, and are likely influenced by their lives. Now this is a direct challenge to positivism because the assumption within a positive mindset, positivist mindset, is that laws are rational. 
and that judges will apply them rationally. But what the legal realists argue is that laws are not rational. Laws, they say, are ambiguous and are often contradictory. Third point. Since judges can interpret the law, what the realists argue is that judges should be motivated by the public good. Fourth point. Since lawyers can predict how a judge is going to rule by examining their behavior and past cases, what they should do is use that to their advantage so as to choose their forum wisely. What critical legal studies argues is that law is neither neutral nor value free. <coughs> What critical legal theorists have tried to do is to demonstrate that powerful social groups have greater access to lawmaking and can thus craft laws that are more favorable towards their interests. One, they say that law is politics. Laws can be manipulated to reach particular results. Second characteristic of critical legal studies, they regard law to be indeterminate. So using standard legal arguments, it is possible to reach opposing conclusions. Third characteristic, critical legal theorists argue that law will only change when society changes. So if law exists to protect the interests of the wealthy, they say that the law will only change when the wealthy and powerful become concerned with the interests of others. What CLS scholars, critical legal scholars, critical legal studies scholars will say, or what they agree on, is that change is needed, but they do not agree on how that change should take place. So some form of reform is necessary but what exactly that reform looks like will vary from place to place. What is an important difference between the way Chambliss and Seidman are presenting society and the way society is presented within those previous theories that we've looked at? Which model do positivism and natural law fall in? and Tikanga as well. 